Hello and welcome to this discussion session on the ghost of Richard III by Christopher Brooke. I am your host Robert Crichton and I am here primarily as a really gratuitous plug for my own work. In a week's time, little less than a week's time by the time this podcast goes out, I will be performing live, a live video stream of a performance of this poem, The Ghost of Richard III, from the Key Theatre in Sudbury. Uh, we've been working on this show for a little over a month now, uh, and it's based on, honestly, this, this particular poem that we're going to be talking about today, but we're also going to be talking about other Richard III's. Other Richard III's are available. And I came across this text and these other texts that we may be looking at uh, also in the future, thanks to uh, uh, going to the Changing Histories conference. Was it last year? Was it earlier than that? I forget. Time is getting very flexible these days. And um, having gone to that uh, uh, lovely conference, uh, heard a, a wonderful paper about, about Richard and, and these works and was inspired to dig them out immediately and see if I could plunder them to turn them into a show. And, uh, and lo and behold, so it has come to pass. I say it is all down to my uh, wonderful guest here to, today, as who I'm going to ask, introduce yourself and, uh, and your wonderfulness. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am Yitka Stolova. I am a Title A Fellow in English Literature at Trinity College, Cambridge and I work on the portrayals of Richard III in the 17th century. Excellent. So, as I say, there's a spectrum of texts that we, we can look at. There's, there's, there's obviously, there's one I can think of that I think many people will know, but there are also lots and lots of other bits and pieces available. Um, so could you, could you, as a sort of opening gambit, talk through some of those and also your relationship with them as well? How did you end up? looking at this material? Well, I must say it has been a very long story. Uh, it all started for me in uh, Prague during my undergraduate studies, where I focused on uh, that Richard III you're thinking of. And uh, then for my master's, which I also completed at Charles University, I was looking at the pre-Shakespearean pre portraits of Richard III as a definition of about a century uh, of portrayals, which really spans the uh, very exciting and very turbulent decades right after the Battle of Bosworth, uh, 1485, the moment when Richard's posthumous story, posthumous reputa reputation started unfolding following his death. And for my PhD, which I completed at Trinity College, Cambridge, I looked at those portrayals in the 17th century and I was also following this project during my first junior research fellowship at Jesus College, Oxford. And then I went back to Cambridge to complete this as a postdoctoral project. So I'm currently working on a monograph covering this idea, Richard, Richard as, a, as a reflection of a historical figure and also Richard as a myth, as it were. And I should also add that I'm sim simultaneously editing a bilingual edition of Richard III English, Czech, and that's also very exciting to see how that works at the intersection of two languages. So you're talking about the intersection between between history and and myth, um, but then there's a difference to some degree with what they considered history then to what we today might consider um, a, a more accurate or a different interpretation of events. And um, so the, the text is sort of doing a dance with that. Uh, is that a fair fair generalization? Absolutely. That's one of the interesting things you have with this character. Um, he is very liminal, very extreme in perceptions. Tyrant, usurper, murderer, you have it. Mm. Um, but also you can examine on the shifts, slight shifts that happen with his perception, um, how history was understood and how that mythology was understood. So it feels really significant. I'm not necessarily speaking about those shifts from the black to the white legend, those really big, um, strong views one might have, but it's the slight things that really become much more prominent in the 17th century than they do previously. So that was partly the reason why I focused on this period, because suddenly you examine that 
symbol of tyranny through new historical circumstances and also in a obviously fresh light of a evolving literary tradition and also art that's another thing i look at the way he was portrayed not just in paintings but also engravings woodcuts and it's a fascinating story that becomes just not as straightforward as one might perhaps expect necessarily so obviously we we we, we know of uh, one one quite famous uh, play version uh, we have been reading in the, uh, as part of our exploring sessions, we've been reading The True Tragedy of Richard III as well. This uh, session is all about the ghost of Richard III. What, are, what other Richard III's are available, uh, shall we say text-wise? <laughs> right. Um, we, the story starts mainly, well, it starts with ballads and then with uh, chronicles. Um, Plato, Virgil, one of the early sources that we have, and of course Thomas More that becomes super influential, but unfinished. So when the chroniclers such as Hollandshed start taking over the text, they obviously added, there were loads of other people playing with the story. Uh, we also have a Latin play, university drama, which was pr performed right next doors to me at St. John's Cambridge over three nights a hugely long play and everyone was involved, I think, except for uh, the bed makers, I'm sure, because otherwise the cast list doesn't make any sense. <laughs> uh, so it was a big story of, you know, behold, what will happen to you if you become a tyrant? Don't, don't do it. Mm. A really important moment came with poetry. Richard always had that poetic incarnation. I mentioned ballads already, um, something like the song of Lady Bessie, which shows him as a tyrant, unsurprisingly. Um, that's very early on. But really something which is very important for our text today is a tradition of poetic collections called the Mirror for Magistrates. That was a hugely influential collection of poems, first published 1559, and then it went through loads of reprints and loads of editions. And it basically contained, well, speeches, almost soliloquies of various historic characters who emerge out of hell, come say, you know, look at me, what happened to me? Don't do it, or pity me, and also don't do it. And then they go down to hell. <laughs> and Richard emerged as one of those characters in a poem which was remarkably not good. Even the original editors were not quite sure whether to include it. And then someone said, oh, actually, but the subject matter is so crooked that it would not be fit if he had a nice poem in which he would feature. So a good way to get away with poor verse, as it were. I, no, I, I sorry, I love that. I love that. <laughs> that's, that's an idea of just going, yeah. Well, the 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 character is not very nice, so yeah, I, 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 I can phone it in this week. That'll be fine. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and it, it's nice to see that it began to be seen as a bit of a problem, or at least some people in the 17th century thought, well, let's revisit it, and uh, they didn't necessarily paint it in more positive colors. As I said, for me, it's not a dichotomy of good bad but certainly some better poetry mm. and one thing which one piece which influenced our Christopher Brooke uh, was a new edition of the mirror for magistrates 1610 so only four years before this poem was published mm. and it features new Richard and very much in that idea of the rise and fall of great princes who turn tyrants and this is a, one of the threads that we can recognize in the ghost of uh, Richard III. So interestingly, in the 16, uh, in the first decade or the second decade of the 17th century, we have two spectral incarnations of Richard III. So yes, I think we should probably, should we start talking about the ghost of Richard III, the, the poem itself? Um, so I say I'm, I'm performing it uh, in a cut down version uh, of, of this complete narrative from, from dragged out to hell. He tells his life story from the cradle to the grave um, and, um, and then returns conveniently back to hell again uh, and, um, and goes through quite a journey. Um, so it was written by Christopher Brooke. What do we know about him, uh, his life, his, his background, or 
Um, and uh, why do we know anything about why he was drawn to this particular tale? It's quite a fascinating set of circumstances, actually, um, because Christopher Brooke was not, his first description would not be a poet. He was a member of parliament for York. Um, and his poem was, it really emerged out of a coincidence of political pressures and also just interest in poetry that was generated by his social background. Um, I should say that this, this poem really is fascinating and it did get a bit of attention from literary scholars. Uh, Michelle O'Callaghan has done some wonderful work and also Philip Schwitzer, but it still remains, a lot remains to be said about it. So it's wonderful that it gets its own stage uh, within this project. So why did he write it? Uh, well, when, when we think of Christopher Brooke, we should imagine a person who is very well educated, possibly educated in Cambridge, then he became a lawyer, then he joined uh, Parliament, and he was also very much in touch with the literary culture of London. He forged very solid friendship with John Donne, they were actually neighbors uh, for quite a bit of time. They lived on the same street in London. He uh, knew Ben Johnson, who contributed one of the commendatory poems. We know that uh, among his friends was Inigo Jones, the famous architect uh, and mask uh, designer, as it were. So a really interesting intersection. That was the literary part. So he was really drawn to it, but he didn't publish much actually, this is the most substantial piece. There are a few other bits, other pieces of literature where he might have contributed, but this is the most solid bit. Mm. The other I, part. Sorry, yes. I just wanted to just jump in because you mentioned the uh, the the uh, sort of dedicatory poems at the the beginning of the the text. Now, is this a good time to sort of jump in on that because you mentioned Ben Johnson? Um, and and all these others, there's a, there's a lot there's there's a there's a lot of material there. Um, but uh, it's a real mix as well um, that I find absolutely fascinating. Um, I particularly like Ben Johnson's and uh, uh, and and being placed as the last in 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 the selection. I I, I think that's um, because he doesn't write a long poem. Does 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 does, does old Ben? Um, and, you know, to his friend, the author upon his Richard, when these and such their, their voices have employed, what place is for my testimony void? You know, it's a sort of, it's, it's, oh, oh, I've, everybody else has already spoken. I don't need to say more. Uh, will that do? Uh, <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> no, and some very good names. I mean, Ben Johnson, possibly the most recognizable one. Uh, but we also have George Chapman. Um, mm. We have a few others. But yes, I, I do agree with you that Johnson's poem is curious. It comes at the end and it's also, it's good. And the subject is intriguing. Um, uh, the last two lines are really quite striking. I would wonder if you, you would be able to read them out. Uh, my suffrage brings the all increase to crown thy Richard, raised in song, past pulling down. This is brilliant. So we have Ben Johnson crowning Richard III ultimately in that reputation, quality of the poem. And of course, this is so fascinating because we know that Ben Johnson, he was paid to write a play called Richard Crookback. Either he wrote it and it was lost or he didn't finish it. We don't know. But this is one of a few cases when Ben Johnson writes a commendatory poem uh, on a poem about Richard III. The other one is going to be John Beaumont. And we can see glimpses of Johnson's thinking about the subject. So yes, tyrant, all that, but also certain, certain greatness that to crown thy Richard raised in song, past pulling down. That's a very decent endorsement, I think. Mm. It's interesting. We looked at a while ago on the podcast, uh, Mortimer, his fall, or you know what what survives of that. You know he, he didn't finish it, um, and to a degree, barely started it. Um, but the 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 way he portrays Mortimer in that feels very similar uh, vein. Um, you know, he's this difficult figure 
who you know is both potentially villain and also praiseworthy and and it really that that that, that connection i seem to recall is um it, it f- feels really interesting within that that idea of things that ben johnson might have been drawn to and then uh, uh, um, some things survive some don't i would just add that uh, it's important to remember that this is published in 1614 yeah. big year in uh, history uh, the year of the adult parliament um, so called by james the first who basically he as well as his son are going to have huge problems with generating money they just can't uh, can't function very well in terms of finance and that's a moment when he summons the parliament tries to generate extra taxes and here the the really heated problem and then the years before that was something called the impositions it was basically the right to impose extra taxes on things that you would import and taxation was normally seen as privilege of parliament and the king was saying no that's my privilege and it really generated a lot of lot of problems we see the debates that are going on with you know charles the first later on they very much had roots at that time. And here it is, a member of parliament who made a few speeches, they are recorded, where he really is very keen to maintain the independence of parliament. Yes, recognizing the um, strong power of uh, the monarch, but not absolute power. And one way of seeing this poem or one element of it is that warning against tyranny and absolute power and the twisting of law and that's really important for the context of the poem the question of tyrants is uh, is something that very much appeals to a lot of writers from from the early modern period um something about a monarchy will do that i think uh... <laughs> very much so yeah richard but... will richard will end up being very a very useful example for very different parties. So when we reach the civil war, you will have both the parliamentarians and the royalists somehow finding something in the story that they can can claim for themselves. So he becomes super, super flexible as a historical example. The poem itself, where where do we start with the poem itself? Probably at the beginning. Um, so he's he's dragged dragged from hell and he's not desperately happy uh about this process <laughs> you know he's 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 uh full of pain and fire and this sense of regret you know almost anguish at having to you know once again look at a land who who everybody hates him before he then is through a sort of slightly bizarre and terrifying ritual of drinking from the wittiest politician's skull which i absolutely love his maze are filled with stygian juice brimful and innocent blood fit for an ebon bowl, I quaff to all damned spirits. And then he tells his life story. So, you know, f- f- for you, uh, that opening and, 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 and what's happening with the character of Richard? I will start by saying that one thing which really be- will become something we will be repeating a lot coming back to is that this Richard is really intelligent, really witty. Not all Richards would be, as it were in the tradition, for example, for Ricardo Tetsius. Yeah, I think that could be a, a debate. Uh, this one is smart and he knows it. And we shall see that when he falls, he falls in that intellectual sense, as well as the physical one and the moral one. I love the way this Richard is drawing attention to the artificiality of his creation, as it were. He is rising as a specter. He is showing this is a literary creation. And he creates, he revisits the moment he was conceived all the myths we have about Richard, the peculiar natural phenomena that occurred to highlight someone really strange is coming to the world. But he uses two interesting words. He says that at his conception, there was imagination and seed. We have the physical and the metaphysical. So really, he is describing the conception of his own myth as well as the historical Richard that he's talking about. That's wonder, a wonderful insight and shows that sort of meta quality that this Richard has over his story, which is relatively unique in the canon. Uh, the reason why I th- uh, it's working for me as a, as a performable text is that he is talking to an audience. He's, uh, this, he's talking to a reading audience. Um, 
uh, but it's not like because we've got the uh, or one of the other texts we've got you know the rising to the crown uh, crown of Richard by himself which which feels slightly different here it's not like you're feeling like he's sitting down and writing it here it feels like it's it, it's coming direct to us you know in my case obviously as a performance but you know even on the text it's it it, it doesn't feel like he's sat down and written it or you know or he hasn't got an amanuensis it's coming direct at us and that has an immediacy to it. And I think you're right, the intelligence act, aspect, he really thinks about, he's, really, he's had a few, he's had a hundred plus years to think about his life. Don't know how time works in hell. And he really, um, he really goes into the details. I mean, the bit that leapt out at me when we first read it, and this is material that will come out on the podcast eventually, is when he's talking about, in his childhood, with delight I taught my nature to see fowls to bleed. Uh, you know, it, 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 it seems a, almost a decision to go out and and see horrible things and train himself to be a monster. And that I absolutely found fascinating. Absolutely. This is, I think, one of the most unique features of this particular text, because that's always the, that's the problem we have with this story, that um, where does the character begin and end and where does the framework of historiography beginning and end and this Richard seems to be conscious of it I think that quality of looking back has something to do with it and he offers a sort of an explanation of course at one level it works as an allegory as we said as a warning for tyrants yes so this is one way to to frame it but there is almost an element of exaggeration um, in there are a few details that we find, for example, the way the legend of Richard's physical distortion is amplified. It's interesting, this story, this Richard, I mean, he's spectral, he shouldn't be that physical, although the, um, the title page does uh, show his face as remarkably aged, but we don't get a systematic exploitation of the idea of uh, disability. Mm. But then we have moments where just which never happened before in any other text. And I do think that there, there might be a bit tongue in cheek, I don't know, when he speaks about the uh, that hollow my cheeks upon my breast black hair. Yeah. We don't normally have Richard with hairy chest, born yeah. as a baby. We have Richard who is born with teeth and uh, with legs forward, yes. But this is quite a unique amplification of the legend. And I wonder whether it's serious or not. Well, it's, it's a thing. If he's being told this kind of thing from the off, and it, it's because it, it, the way it then leaks straight into this going to see animals, dead animals, playing with their entrails, you know, the sense of, well, everyone's telling me I'm a monster. Well, let's have a go at it. Let's practice. Let's see. Um, and that leads on to going to watch executions and going to, and, and, and there's an element where uh, I was thinking of it again on that psychological bent of going, He's a bit like um, you see with some psychopaths um, where they train themselves to, you know, to demonstrate emotion and demonstrate things. And this goes into a lot of detail about learning to, I mean, he's not a psychopath. He's, he, he teaches himself to be emotionally distant and, uh, and, and enjoy pain. Uh, in others uh, uh, and they're sort of a mix he's as much it, it seems that he's made and though there is a conscious decision to make himself it's everybody telling him things rather than necessarily being true those things about him I don't know I'm starting to to roll with ideas rather than uh, than uh, things that I thought about much uh, in, in, in different different forms so I, I will stop now uh, <laughs> yeah, well I think this is really uh, very relevant and it is a constant problem in that story as it were story of Richard uh, do you show it as a failure exceptional failure of an individual person a bad person or something which is imposed by the way the story of history developed mm. and uh, this particular Richard seems to be able to see the contours of that go r right around the edges of it so he is doing both and in a very clever way. And that agency he has in training himself, I taught, I learned, I observed, all that. That's really, he is his own author in some ways, but very much conscious of the 
mold within which he needs to fit. Mm-hmm. And that intelligence uh, we see, he really is creating, of course, he's, uh, this is also a travesty on the you know, educated prince, humanist prince who should be ticking all the good boxes and he is sort of ticking all the bad boxes. So there is that uh, irony as well. But I think this is, yeah, this is all but um, a very simplistic parody on, on an example is doing so much more beyond mm. the surface. And I would just say that the, the idea of Richard and blood, that's an interesting one. It's a long motif. And you mentioned uh, the two tragedy of Richard III, which mm. has a fascinating moment at one point when Richard totally loses it after a long soliloquy. And he indulges in this idea of basically drinking rich rich man's blood uh one of the most bloodthirsty moments in any of the texts here he observes that blood although later on he will have moments when he also gets that primeval excitement of touching getting in in touch with with blood but it's yeah it's always always fascinating to observe in texts when he's accused of being bloodthirsty and when he actually does it Mm. because here he does it uh in the way people get university education yes Um, yes, and, and you know he 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 and, and and he does get an education as well, and he's not very you know a standard education. He talks about that briefly, and he's sort of going, yeah, I wasn't that you know I did it, uh, but he's you know it's clearly what he knows. It's not important to his 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 life story almost. You know, it's like he knew he needed to train himself in the in in that other school of uh, of, of wisdom uh, or in a school of darkness um, to get where he wants to be. You know, he's, he's already talking about the, the crown, the, the, the seat, um, you know, getting, getting higher. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. And he really emphasizes not theoretical studying. Again, we might think this is, a, this is the time when something like the book of the courtier, the manual, how to be a good courtier is quite, popular and he really focuses on the practical skills he is going to read the entrails which of course was a great skill in the ancient world then he goes to courtrooms observes how how judges make judgments sentences and then he goes to the execution places Mm. to get used to all of that and get rid of any potential for pity just to stifle that element of humanity he might have and and he uses all of those skills to to teach himself to you know to personate to uh, uh, to to give the you know his his face is a, is a, is forged in a tempered like brass control his, he can control his tongue and even when he goes further and he's talking about you know going into court and scurrying around and 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 looking at at the world there it's all observing it's all watching what people higher up the, the the pecking order do and how their 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 counselors fawn on them and and learning how to work people it, it's also he has a very firm theoretical basis about what he's doing and, and why he's got and the poem does a lot more than that than i'll be doing in in the uh in the the show because you know there's a fundamental difference between a poem and a, a and a performance um but and that's something that really actually is enjoyable to read about actually um you know it it's where it, it says a poem works better as a poem um than 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 in performance because I, I i actually really like some of those those thoughts about uh, about where you know difference between uh, virtues and and what's in ascendancy and what what you you know what will get you more power and what 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 works for you and what works against you i i i i was sort of pained to trim but um you 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 have to uh, in an adaptation. <laughs> mm, absolutely. Well, I, I can see that uh, this would be a necess- necessity, but it's, uh, you know, just to, just to mention it here briefly, the, you know, as you mentioned, the influence of colleges and schools, but also religion, that's going to be important to us, the end of the story, how very cynical he becomes about that. He professed that, but didn't have the reverence in heart. Mm. So he is, as you say, using all that he can use 
to get where he needs to be. The, what you haven't mentioned is the poem is structured in three parts, and that's broadly speaking. The first part is very much about about you know his birth, his nativity, and is titled his character. So it's very much setting up all those dolls before getting too much into what we might call plot, <laughs> as it were, the legend of Richard the Third. And here we sort of enter we enter the Wars of the Roses, basically, don't we, uh, with with a vengeance and. Um, uh, he loses his father quite early on, um, and uh, and uh, and and does his first murder as well. Always, always nice to, to 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 get that in, nice, nice and early. So, uh, thoughts about that that opening of uh, of of the legend? That's the moment when Christopher Brooke most recognizes the impact of Shakespeare, the influence of the story, and we will find multiple echoes, uh, metaphorical echoes, as it were. Uh, but still, there is that interesting twisting. You know, he basically he opens by addressing Shakespeare directly to him, but then he reaches a moment when he says, "Oh yeah, you know, this was uh, this was a really um, significant thing that boosted my fame, and who with my actions dignified his pen." And that feels like a very lovely compliment until we realize that. He dignified his pen, Shakespeare dignified his pay, with Richard's actions. So Richard is almost saying, well, you wrote a really good play thanks to what I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very nice twist in it. But no, it's very, very uh, complimentary. And he's wondering, so where is my space? When there is this wonderful stage, very uh, tantalizing stage incarnation, what should I do? And he says, okay, my task is to inform this ignorant age. So again, we are going back to the idea of intellect, information, education. It moves forward and it does pick up things that are very, very explicit in, in, in the Shakespeare, the, 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 the letter G, George, all those, those details. Um, the way uh, Buckingham is threaded into the narrative is very much from there. It's, it's, uh, Buckingham in here is very, uh, is, fits within that framework whereas uh, the buckingham of say the true tragedy is very different i mean if, if anyone hasn't listened to or watched our videos on uh, the true tragedy it is a truly fascinating play but buckingham here is constantly talked about you know my hand my my friend but i love the way it's now steal back to buckingham i made my friend him i sustained with hope and fed with air um he's not offering him much is he <laughs> no um buckingham is one of those people who help him rise to power although i wonder i wonder whether we haven't really spoken about sources uh to this i i wonder whether brooke re read one particular work of history that would have been quite recent back then by john speed who speaks about buckingham as the prime actor who helped Richard rise. So Buckingham gets much more agency. Mm. He is not just the second person next to him. And I think we, yeah, th there are traces of that here, uh, at least in that, yeah, in that idea, you know, he does mention the, uh, uh, the wings and the desire of soaring. So the, the words I use, but yeah, here Richard, he's that intelligent person. But I think the question of agency, you know, how do, tyrants happen is it their supreme wicked intellect or is it the combination of all the factors around them and everyone is sort of complicit complicit by not speaking out that's mm. the question this po poem is asking among uh, many others i mean it's interesting the way brooke uh, talks about anyone who is opposition as you know just going well they're idiots you know because they weren't very strong I, mean, I, I don't have the line in front of me, but it, it's, I think it's when talking about Grey Rivers uh, are born, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the fighting, fighting me when they weren't strong, you know, right, right, it has nothing then, you know, and it can't win and they were idiots and, um, and Hastings to a degree ends up in the same boat as well. You know, you know, if you don't have a power base, you see, I've worked, I've, I've trained myself from a early age. I know how to do this game. You don't. And I find that really interesting. And, and the poem really goes into that sort of th theatrical thing from, uh, from Richard's life of, you know, putting out to the public the arguments for, for well, let's, let's, let's get rid of the, these princes. They're, 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 they're illegitimate, honest. 
um, where's the birth certificate? Um, kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and he's got his own uh, mouthpiece in Dr. Shaw, who I, I absolutely adore. <laughs> it's lovely how this bit uh, with Shaw arguing, really, you know, everyone is Alice, Alice is illegitimate, is just Richard. And he, the poem rehearses that stumbling and the repetition and the coming to the cue, which is actually something that Thomas More writes about. Mm. And we don't have, we don't have it in the true tragedy, for example. There's something super theatrical, even in the original, big, big quotation marks, original story of Richard III, and the orchestration of power and public performance that really tries to convince the public that this is the right way forward. Mm. The poem is very conscious of that power. Yes, I am, I'm uh, very aware that I, I had to, uh, to trim elements of this, which uh, slightly distorts its, uh, its uh, meaning. So that sense of he's supposed to come on cue and then he doesn't is a bit late. And the whole thing's a bit, bit of a disaster. It's a bit, it doesn't go very well. Um, um, which uh, it's it's really nice in the poem, and I I, I absolutely adored. But it, it was a case, and I have to apologise to Christopher Book that we needed to move the narrative forward. So it was moderately successful, uh, and in the end, and uh, and we go straight to Buckingham doing the same, but with different people. I love the way he talks about the uh, the sort of the the wealthy, uh, the wise wealthy magistrates I, I i i like that as a combination <laughs> it's not the <laughs> you know are they wise or are they just no they're wealthy they're wealthy and the way it's actually laid out there is it's just going it's almost like he just goes wise well it's like he deliberately stops saying the word wise um uh and i absolutely adore that <laughs> the following line such they were then or whatever they are now um again we really are reminded of the context of the problems of James the First's reign mm. and the disillusionment that people feel. So yeah, history is sort of compressed now and then maybe happening at the same time. You can see the present moment through the prism of the past and realize something really important about what's going on with you right now. Mm. And it's, obviously he gets the crown and then everything gets much darker. And it becomes much more internalized because he's, you know, he contemplates killing the princes. Um, and obviously that's where his relationship with Buckingham goes downhill and he has to find Tyrrell to organize the murders for him. Um, but from that point onwards, that sense of the walls closing in on the character seems to be increased. And we move towards by the time that he kills the princes, he sort of has a nervous breakdown in the text so uh, any thoughts on, on sort of in that sort of direction of um of, of Tyrrell the murder and then then that that closing in well absolutely this is a absolutely fundamental moment in the story and it has always been portrayed like that you know going back to Polydor Virgil there is that moment of crisis once he reaches the crown and then it goes downhill but here it's really realized as a intellectual moral even physical breakdown. And I feel one thing which Brooke does very interestingly is that he not only creates this as a pressure of conscience, which it is also that, but it's not just that. It's also Richard at that point when he organizes the murder and he becomes very poetic about the description of the princess. It's almost as if he was there. He sees them being very innocent and dying. But then he suddenly becomes much more shallow, much more superficial. And that peak, that rise and fall in that De Carcibus on fall parameter, which, as I said, is related to the mirror for magistrates framework and all that, here it's heightened by that intellect. So when we think about it, right before Richard, when he is still on the rise, he is giving himself advice how to be a successful well, Machiavellian. One of the things he's saying, uh, you know, make political allies. Another thing, don't grant petitions. It's going to be really costly. Another thing, don't show emotions. Don't be readable. And what happens right afterwards when he gains the crown? He turns against Buckingham. He destroys that uh, alliance. Then he asks Tyrell to kill the princes who 
is a very self-interested sycophant, we could say. Mm. And ultimately, he loses control over his behavior. He becomes readable. So I think the reason why, for me, this fall in Brooks's ghost is so sharp is because he falls not just according to the pre-existing parameters of the genre. He falls from his own preconceived greatness, as it were. Mm. There were ideas that he rejects, which he himself constructed. It's an interesting thing that this may be more a performance thing adding on to a text. Um, but when he starts talking about the princes and he talk about all the, 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 the presaging storms and all the stuff around that. Um, and then he starts effectively victim blaming them by going, well, they knew it was coming. They, 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 they were there. They saw the print. They knew. And it, it, there, there's a sort of weird, um, you know, the the angry comet thirsted to be fed with their hearts, but they knew these storms should cease, almost like it's their fault. And then when he's talking about the grooms, the the the, the two uh, Tyrrell gets to actually do the murder itself, and he says, you know, they they're chased by furies or or something, uh, tortured with despair and howl in horror of their murderous deed. And in my mind, that's no, it's that's him. That's him. He's he's projecting that onto somebody else, um, and that's something that's that, and because that leads straight into this long discussion of of losing control of himself bodily as well as uh, mentally. He's he's no, he's talking about his he he has a total breakdown, um, and there's something very lived about that and very detailed that I find really interesting. No, um, absolutely. Um, the moment when he before he has this breakdown, he has one of one. I think one of the most wonderful lines for me in the poem, when he ha is trapped in this, in these doubts, and then has that "No, Richard, in thine own power, still be free." The mm. declaration of complete independence and justification of, of what he has done for himself, which is so important for his intellect, and then it just goes absolutely downhill, as mm. you explained both uh, intellectually and physically into some very 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 striking gruesome details well it's a, it's the fact that he's, he's he he talks himself into killing the princes in stages as well you know he's actually essentially has a a, a demon on his shoulder talking him into it uh really fun to perform um and and, and, and so it, it, it even that journey into the killing the princes it's the you know, the conception of a thought happening quite a long way and then and then the, and he knows it's a dark and evil and terrible thing to do even at that early stage so it's uh, it, it, it's really nicely woven i really like it it's it, it makes it this section quite hard to cut because it is so nicely put together and and you know kudos kudos <laughs> it wow. builds up quite a striking momentum um, as he's falling he's falling deeper and deeper and I think deeper than some previous Richards as it were because he reaches that moment when he really asks himself what conscience is isn't it and mm -hmm. there the question again I mean it's it's hard not to think of what will come later in Milton's Satan and the rejection of God. Yes, because he's there going, you know, I'm, I, I, I can't, I, you know, my, I've gone too far. I, I you know, there's, uh, I, uh, there, there are some lovely lines when he's talking about, um, uh, you know, he could get go and beg and, and cry and, and, and do all these things. It's not going to make the blindest bit of difference. We could again draw a comparison between this moment here in this poem and the true tragedy. Mm -hmm. There's that wonderful soliloquy where he he suddenly experiences the entire nature conspiring against him for revenge so there is an element of fear of consequence mm. this richard goes deeper he falls deeper and becomes much more sophisticated because he recognizes yeah you know when he wants to he says even eating you know eat into marble even that wouldn't be enough mm. he rejects the grace of god he realizes just like Milton Satan, that the hell is himself. And out of that, he doesn't manage to get, dig himself out. And that's really, I think he falls possibly the deepest of the Richards I have read about, where he really, he 
again, almost rises in a dark way in the sense that he takes the role of God in judging whether he is still eligible for God's mercy, which of course is a sin and you shouldn't do it. And he does. It's again, if I was to um, point that should be invoked Shakespeare's Hamlet, when Claudius mm. falls to his knees, tries to find that, um, yeah, repentance and can't because he, he still enjoys the benefit of it. This Richard goes further. He rejects that idea because he feels he is beyond the possibility of grace. Deep darkness in his soul. Um, there is that heaven in him. I saw this hell my thoughts had shaped and bred. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating rejection, self-rejection almost. Again, the intellect doing all the dark things instead of God, as it were, instead of history, instead of judgment. It's Richard, it's self-scripted. Because by this point, we are into uh, the narrative of uh, Richmond is coming. You know, it's not just internal foes that he's fighting as well. There's, there's just that on the distance, there is this potential rival who's coming. And of course, we all know where it's going to go. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we're moving towards the final, the final curtain as we go into the sort of the final, final section of the poem um with the uh the as we head towards the um the battle of bosworth i i'm really quite i really like richard's descriptions of how he can't really trust his own men because they don't love him these are a company of frozen hearts um you know and he's having to bribe some of them really quite extravagantly <laughs> to uh, to stay on board as well as you know hold hold some people hostage as well um, mm. And um, yeah, whereas everyone everyone loves Richmond, everyone loves Richmond, isn't he great? So yeah, it's it that again, it's that building of that sense of despair. You know, he's pulling out of he's pulled out of himself by by war rather than by recovery, as it were, from his uh, his, his his cogitations. And again, we again uh, we get the sense of gruesome ending. That's another moment where when. Uh, after Richard falls, as it were, we didn't really speak about it, did we? But the the sense of um, physical disintegration um, here at the end of the death, uh, at, at the end of the battle, it becomes the yeah the brain that spills out of his skull. Oh yes, it's it's it. I I I find performing that that it weirdly is almost dis, you know dispassionate. In a weird way, it's like he's standing and looking at himself. I, I, this may be a projection onto the text, um, but it's just they charactered in wounds my uh, tyranny and thus performed my bloody tragedy. And so my brain they dashed, uh, which flew on every side as they would. Um, and he gives examples for each one of of how he sort of deserves it, um, you know. And there's knowledge there which he perhaps didn't have at the very beginning. Mm. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, spoilers, by the way, everyone. He dies at Bosworth. He doesn't win. He doesn't win. And uh, I mean, the horse, the battle itself is actually quite swift. There isn't that much battle action, and it moves with a right lick. You know, once signal is given, it just goes on and on and on and on, and 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 uh, all these images of blood and swords in flesh do sheathe. You know, this these 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 very uh, aggressive images that we're getting. Following on from this dream sequence, which possibly uh, we, we may have seen elsewhere um, in, in, in form before. But yeah, we get to that, that, that final, final death. And um, I mean, do disagree. That's just how I'm sort of playing with it in, in performance. And, you know, it's slightly out of some of the context because I, I, uh, you know, I've cut the, cut the text. I think that's a you know, very astute reading, what you're saying, that he looks again at his, himself, his fate. His historical fate and the way it was depicted in in the sources and it's nice to see Brooke being quite precise about quite a few things the fact that you know he takes down um, Brendan who was on Richmond's side so he has that detail of a name yeah mm. we would find that in Holland Shed the fact that he was he died not in a one-on-one um, -on -one combat he was overwhelmed mm. Again, 
accurate. And of course, the brain, I mean, that's, that's a very nice detail for, for us post-2013 um, when they found him, because now we know that he died by having a very severe head trauma. Mm. Yes, it, it, it re almost all the details there feel accurate. Um, you know, the, it, it, it seems like quite a good representation of it all. Um, and um, yeah, so that, 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 that's kind of why I went with the clinical nature. I mean, in, 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 a, in a different universe, you know, if I was using projection mm. and doing all sorts of things, you know, you'd have x-ray images and, you know, stuff from, from, from the actual archaeology would actually be quite interesting uh, to, to mix in with this because um there isn't much in this where i'm sitting and going mm, yeah we don't quite think that anymore um it's all mostly the spin which is the uh that element um then you strike to hell absolutely yes and <laughs> back to our imagination and i mean that i uh, just to briefly stay with the idea of that brain spilling over i was checking this and it's peculiar that we don't have that many original sources that would mention it mm. that particular detail it occurs in the song of lady bessie which i said was very very early mm. basically from the late 1480s right after the battle there is a detail of that but then well, with the dramatic sources we mentioned they don't really show it and the chronicles they mentioned that he was dragged on a horse uh here also implied but uh mentioned in fact but mm. not the detail with the skull Mm. Um, we have it with uh, John Beaumont, and now we have it in a photograph of that mm. skeleton that was unearthed, and that shows it very precisely. So we may wonder whether it was, you know, conjecture, or was there any sort of popular knowledge of mm. that battle lingering over, which didn't make into the chronicles, but would come out as metaphorical details. Who knows? But mm. it's striking, absolutely arresting, spilling of the brain. And because as we're on Bosworth, of course, there is the, 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 the other uh, variation we haven't mentioned, I think, explicitly, I think you mentioned uh, Beaumont, but I don't think we've actually mentioned the title, but there is a, another poem called Bosworth Field, which is, um, again, very, very performable and something that I'm looking at as a future thing uh, for more of an ensemble piece. Um, but that's, that's, that's uh, another wonderful uh, part of part of these interweaving texts because that's that's full of detail this battle is very short uh but bosworth field is um is 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 it's got all the action <laughs> and very too many so. names actually this this doesn't have this is very very spare with names uh you know it focuses on characters quite precisely uh, and and very well i i, I have to say uh, so, uh, final final thoughts about this. Uh, anything we haven't covered so far with 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 the ghost um, of Richard the Third? I'm sure we could sit here for hours discussing individual details because there's so much in the poem mm. in terms of classical allusions, uh, very interesting, arresting details, echoes of different sources that were incorporated into and played with and slightly changed. There is so much. It's a wonderful poem. Really, really witty, very intelligent, written by a witty writer and creating a very smart, dark Richard. I like it. Uh, and yes, obviously, I'll, I want you all to go and watch the, uh, the performance uh, that I'll be doing uh, and maybe performances in the distant future if uh, we, we come back to this text. Um, but also go and go and uh, there will be links in the show notes. Go and read the poem. It is it is it's a really interesting uh, work. I, 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 and there's a lot there that obviously you won't get from from my performance. Further down the line, we will do a full audio reading of the text. Um, I don't know who's going to be reading that or how we're going to do that yet, but that's saying that will happen further down the line uh, because I think uh, we can pick out more of the stuff that uh, has had to be cut for for time and narrative uh, flow and and performancey things um so yeah so there will be links in the show notes uh, to go out and, uh, and and read for yourself make make up your own decision uh, you make up your own mind about uh, about how you uh, find the uh, the ghost of of poor richard the third i think i will just end by mentioning one particular 
description of Richard of himself, which I think is really, it, it encapsulates the increasing progression of uh, his spirit, that my inward darkness, we are here in this poem to examine that inward darkness of Richard and the remarkable torments that his soul could be seen uh, as experiencing. Well, thank you very much for talking with me uh, for this episode. Um, uh, links to everything in the show notes and a safe performance hopefully will be existing very soon for you to watch online, um, either live or uh, uh, recorded and uh, stored on some sort of internet thing. Uh, I'd say once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ika, for your, um, for your uh, time. And, thank you for uh, inviting me. And goodbye. <laughs>